Welcome to another installment of Christmas in Quarantine. It's Christmas Past's impromptu miniseries of indeterminate length. I'm publishing one new episode each day until things are looking better on the COVID-19 crisis. Now, if you're listening in real time, you'll know that the federal social distancing guidelines were just extended through the end of April. So it looks like we'll be seeing a lot of each other for at least another month. Though these things change pretty quickly, so who knows for sure. One thing you might be doing to keep busy these days is playing games. Me, I'm always up for a good game of Christmas trivia, and luckily, so were a couple of my Christmassy friends. But before we get to that, I hope as always that you are staying safe and healthy, that you're practicing all of the common sense guidelines and taking your advice only from trained medical professionals, and of course, treating the situation with the seriousness it deserves. Now, you are about to join in on a devious twist on Christmas trivia. Todd Killian from Christmas Clatter and Jerry Davila from the forthcoming podcast Totally Rad Christmas joined me to play a game of two truths and a lie. We'll take turns presenting three related Christmas tidbits and trying to separate fact from fiction. Play along with us and see how you do. I'll come back at the end to say goodbye, but for now, let's put your Christmas spirit and your lie detecting skills to the test with me, Todd, and Jerry. <laughs> And we're going to begin now. Your first question has to do with ivy. Now, you guys both know as students of Christmas history that the Christmas tree is a fairly recent addition to the celebration of Christmas. It was only since about 1870 that the average American household had a Christmas tree. And before Mm -hmm. that, most American homes or and other homes that celebrated Christmas would put up other greenery, mostly holly ivy and mistletoe. And that even predates Christmas. The Romans celebrating Saturnalia would decorate their homes with holly and ivy. So when it comes to ivy as a Christmas tradition, it actually has a very long history. And so along the way, some funny things can happen, including which of these. So here's your first statement. According to one custom, if maidservants asked a man to bring ivy for Christmas decoration and he did not, they were allowed to nail a pair of his breeches to the gate and deny him the, quote, well-known privilege of the mistletoe, end quote. That's your first (laughs) statement. Here's the second statement. Ivy, as well as other greenery, often was thought to have medicinal properties, so it was once common to snort the juice of the berries and leaves in order to purge the brain of rheumatism and other ailments. Here's your third (laughs) statement. Ivy punch was a pungent ivy-based concoction served warm on Christmas Eve, and it was popular for its effects as a mild hallucinogen. So, gentlemen, is it nailing uh, underbreaches to the gate? Was it snorting berry juice? Or was it the ivy punch that is a mild hallucinogen that is the lie among those three? Hmm. <laughs> well, two have to, two have to deal with... Uh somehow ingesting ivy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that makes me that makes me lean towards uh hanging the uh britches up on the fence post but i'm not 100 percent sure what are you thinking jerry maybe that's just what i want you to think (laughs) see that one to me it sounds like uh much more plausible than the other ones um snorting berry juice uh, i don't know i to, that's the one that to me sta- really stands out it just seems a little more preposterous i suppose <laughs> on, on the other hand yeah just, just one that that is that would be a little more um not lascivious um uh, but just definitely uh, unseemly for the time all right, the time I, has yeah. come to lock in All your right. votes. I think I'm leaning more towards the uh, the snorting of the the berry juice. And to peak, like uh, you're saying you think that is the false one. I think that is false. Okay. Yes. All right, I will I will stick with my gut and say the hanging of the britches on the fence post is false. And time for the big reveal. You were both wrong. It was oh. Ivy Punch. There is no such thing. Uh, <laughs> And so, yes, actually snorting berry juice and leaf juice was supposed to do things like um, clear up runny noses and problems with the eyes and things like that. And yes, according, there was this old, um, I think it was in the 17th century, that was the custom with nailing the breeches to the post. 
and also about the denying the well-known privilege of the mistletoe, something that I think a lot of people these days don't realize is back in the day, kissing under the mistletoe was seen as something that only people from lower classes would do. It really wasn't until the 19th or early 20th century that it became a lot more common. So that was really yeah. something that you would see among like maidservants and people in that social strata. Oh, huh. wow. I know. I, I definitely wouldn't have guessed it. Ivy Punch sounded really authentic to me. <laughs> yeah, it, it did. I, at first I thought... Well done, good like sir. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now let's do a minor clarification of the rules. There are no points taken off for incorrect answers. You can only score points, and so far, neither of you have. So, <laughs> we're moving on to the next round, <laughs> where it is going to be Todd's good. turn to read a question, and therefore it'll be Jerry and Brian's turn to possibly earn a point. All right. I'm well, going to get it this time. Well, hope we'll see. Um, I do I do want to say that my first question is um, it was hard for me to build a lot around it, but rest of my questions are much better. But I found this so fascinating, and it has to do with Elvis at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. So that's the subject. All right. All right. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm going to give this in more of a traditional um, multiple choice fashion. Uh, Elvis was excited for his 1957 Christmas album, namely because he could record which song? I'll Be Home for Christmas, Blue Christmas, or White Christmas. Now, one of those songs he did not want to record at all. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. So, okay. Yeah. Part of the, this question suggests to me that there is there is a possible timeline where Elvis mm -hmm. Presley hated Blue Christmas. This is common with some singers, like they'll hate a song. Like I think Slash from Guns N' Roses routinely will say in interviews that he thinks the riff from Sweet Child of Mine is like Sweet one of the of stupidest yep. things he ever wrote, but it just became famous. So I could see a possible timeline where Elvis hated Blue Christmas, but it got famous anyway, and then there was just no stopping that train. I could also see, because I think I heard a story one time about Elvis watching Robert Goulet on the television, and then he shot the TV because he's like, man, that guy is so, so good of a singer. And Bing Crosby has a similarly <laughs> smooth voice. So maybe uh -huh. he hated White Christmas because he thought Bing Crosby was such a smooth singer. And I'm sorry, what was the third song, Todd? I'll Be Home for Christmas. I don't and, recall Elvis singing that one. No. And that was it about is. the war, right? Like that was for sold. That song came out mm -hmm. during World War II. What what war did Elvis fight in? He was enlisted, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, he, but I, I think it was World War II, wasn't it? No, he's stationed no, no, it in was a Korean Germany, war, wasn't it? Um, it was mid fifties, so it is either late Korean War or yeah. early mm -hmm. Vietnam. Right. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go with "I'll Be Home for Christmas." It just I, I don't remember. I don't remember him singing that one. I mean, uh, yeah, all, all three songs were on the 1957 uh, Christmas album release that he did. It was just that one of them he really didn't so want to do. One of, one yeah. of them he really did not want to do at all. I'm going with Blue Christmas. Hmm. Well, in that case, okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm crazy wrong here, but I'm gonna say White Christmas. Well, Brian's got it. It's Blue Christmas. He did not want to do <laughs> oh, my Christmas goodness. at all. Oh, I'm like, he's, oh, for two. <laughs> he said it was too depressing and too sad to be a great Christmas song. Well, he's he was right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Easily one of my least favorite Christmas songs. Although Rankin Bass did manage to uh, put it into one of their Christmas specials. So, <laughs> Well, you haven't heard Blue Christmas till you heard Porky Pig singing anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right, Jerry, time to put our feet to the fire. What do you got for us? Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> as uh, people that know me uh, know, I'm, I'm really into comic books and sci-fi and fantasy. So one of my favorites is Marvel Comics, and they're known for releasing holiday specials every Christmas. So the plots of three of these are as follows. And you'll have to pick which one, of course, is false. So comic number one. The giant alien dragon Fin Fang Foom battles a giant Hydra robot Santa Claus. That's A. Option B, Santa Claus gets injured by Dr. Doom's castle booby traps and Doom fills in for Santa, delivering the rest of his toys. 
or letter C, the Red Skull uses a cosmic cube to wipe Santa from everyone's memory and makes himself the face of Christmas. Which one of those do you think it is? Fin Fang Foom battling a giant Hydra robot Santa, Dr. Doom delivering Christmas toys for Santa, or uh, Red Skull trying to make himself into Santa Claus? I'm just feeling pretty grateful that two of those are actually true. (laughs) (laughs) I think we're all winners here. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) They're pretty great, by the way. (laughs) Um, I don't even know how to begin piecing that one together. I mean, at least with the the Elvis one, we there there was something to go on, like to like. Yeah. Well, maybe he just didn't like that song. These, I'm just gonna. St- all I can do is stab yeah. in the dark. Well, how about you, Todd? Well, I grew up, I grew up a comic book fan, but I never did dig deep, deep into them. I, I recognize those character names, but I don't recognize any of the story names. I'm kind of leaning one way um, over the others, just because. Uh, I think the way it was worded more than anything, but that's that's not any great indication either. So, I'm going with Red Skull. Uh, that, that's the one I was leaning you're towards thinking? too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely <laughs> was. Okay, well, I'm locking so. in my vote. I don't think anyone could convince me to not go yeah. that way. I, I, I'm going to go with Red Skull as well. Okay. That is actually the lie. Wow. I'm a terrible wow. liar, apparently. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> so the good news is I'm great at telling the truth. <laughs> right, right. Uh, the, the, the Cosmic Cube one was what kind of set off a little flag in my head on that one. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can't believe there actually really was a comic where Fin Fang Foom, this giant alien dragon, fought a giant robot Santa Claus created by Hydra. I mean, that's just, that blew my mind. I remember reading that, and it, uh, yeah, that, that's really a great comic, actually. <laughs> oh, All right, so we have now reached the end of round one, so let's do a check of the score. Brian, that's me, is in the lead with two points. Todd has one. Jerry, maybe this is the Ugh. round where you'll get yourself on the board. So how about this one? <laughs> this is probably something we're all familiar with, is Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Uh, Todd, you're a big Ooh, fan yeah. of Emmett Otter, aren't you? Yes, all yes. All right. Now the pressure's on. (laughs) (laughs) So here are three statements pertaining to Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Statement number one, Kermit the Frog appears in the special, but he was taken out after Disney acquired the rights to the Muppets. Statement number two, bluegrass singers the Osborne Brothers sued Jim Henson's production company, claiming that the song Barbecue from the special was plagiarized from one of their songs. Or is it statement three, one scene was so difficult to get right that it took more than 200 takes? All right. I know this one. So, <laughs> oh, wow. That was uh, yeah. <laughs> So by, by uh, virtue of actually knowing the answer, Todd, what is, what is your guess? <laughs> My guess is the second one about being sued uh, yes. for the song Barbecue. Yes, that was what I was going to guess also. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we locking in our answers with that? I'm locking I, I, that one in. Yes, definitely. The Osborne Brothers are, are a bluegrass band that I just dis- I was googling random uh, uh-huh. bluegrass bands yesterday to try to find one to make a convincing lie. Um, uh-huh. As far as I can tell, there is no lawsuit against Jim Henson's production company. So wait, so which one was a lie? The lie was that uh, the Osborne Brothers sued Jim Henson for plagiarism. Oh, okay. Yes. So we did get it right. So we did get it right then. Yes, that is correct. Uh, so you're both on the board now. Yay. Todd with two points and Jerry with one point. All right. All right. All right I'm going to catch up. I'm going to catch up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. My, uh, my next question, I'm going with uh, decorating trends. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one, American GIs stationed in West Germany after World War II helped turn nutcrackers into Christmas decorations. The snow globe was invented by an accident by a mechanic trying to improve the light bulb. Or, in lieu of shiny glass ornaments, empty Coca-Cola bottles were once placed in Christmas trees to refract and reflect the lights or the candles. Hmm. Okay. Well, I happen to know that one of those is true, just from my own research on another topic. But I don't want to say which one because I don't want Jerry to steal my point. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I got to. Oh man, um, I should know. I should know the second one. I mean, I, I have a degree in physics, and I work at a Christmas store where I deal all in lights. So I should know <laughs> about the snow globe, and yet I don't. Uh, interestingly enough, um, what was what was the first one again? American GIs stationed in West Germany after World War II helped turn nutcrackers into Christmas decorations. Mm. Now that's plausible because electric lights came from a lot of them came from Germany, where they'd have mm-hmm. these glass blow up ones that kind of look like uh, like in different figures. And so, German Christmas ornaments being popularized in the states is actually a really common thing, but it, it goes way before World War II. This is maybe like turn of the century, World War I even. So I would have a hard time believing that it would take until World War II for nutcrackers to become common in America. At the mm-hmm. same time, the nutcracker ballet itself is actually a really recent Christmas tradition. It's like one of the newest ones we have, like maybe from the 60s or 70s, I think. I did an episode about this uh, in 2017. Oh, I remember that one, actually. So, <laughs> man. So the thing is with the Coca-Cola, like, are, is, are we to assume that you're saying that it was became a popular trend or just like someone somewhere did it one time? That it was a... Uh... Uh, pop, uh, popular but temporary trend, depending on uh, economic circumstances. I'm I'm going with that one. Hmm. I think I'm actually going to go with the Nutcracker one. To me, that one the, that sounds about right. Well, the the lie is empty Coke bottles being used as uh, Christmas oh, decorations. <laughs> I'm so, oh man. Yeah, but it, <laughs> Everybody loves a, an underdog, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, it was uh, soldiers remaining in Germany after the war sent back the dolls uh, to America as gifts. And later on they would um, be popularized in the States. So mm-hmm. it did take the nutcracker a little bit longer to catch on more than, uh, glass ornaments and then um edwin prezi was the um mechanic that was trying to prove uh, improve light for surgery and he was trying to use a trick that shoemakers used where they would put a bowl of uh, water in front of a candle but he was trying to do that with a light bulb and that's when he came up with the snow globe hmm. in 1900 wow all right 1900 All right, Jerry, hit us. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, I do love Rankin Bass. Uh, Just something about it every time I watch it just brings me back to my childhood. And, uh, you know, they're pretty famous um, for their Christmas specials featuring um, traditional and animagic stop motion animation. So here's uh, three little tidbits about Rankin Bass, and you can choose which one is true and or which one is not true. So the first one is Rankin Bass produced The Stingiest Man in Town, a remake of the live action musical of the same name, which starred Basil Rathbone. They created three Little Drummer Boy specials divided into books, each one based on a different pious legend. Or The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus is their only Christmas TV special not to have a celebrity narrator. Interesting. Hmm. Let's see. So the stingiest uh, man in town. That was um, that wasn't that originally like like a live action movie. It was like a, a short adaptation of a Christmas Carol. Mm-hmm. It was a musical, and, actually. Or was it? Yeah, um, <laughs> it, it's ringing a bell, but I don't. I can't really recall from where. So the little drummer boy, like, hmm. Yeah, this is another stumper. I really have nothing to, to go on to sort of no, I, talk my way my, through it. My rank and bass knowledge is <laughs> minimal, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> because uh, once you get past Rudolph and a couple other things, you really have to be dedicated to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they... <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, then. Just for just to put something down, I'm gonna say it's the little drummer boy. 
I'll go with the uh, stingiest man when I, and that's just a complete guess. <laughs> Final answers. Final. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It it actually was the little drummer boy that's the oh. lie. They only oh, created two goodness. little drummer boy specials, <laughs> and the <laughs> second one is not based off of any legend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that brings yes. round two to a close. Now, fellas, the score is Brian has four, Todd Man. has two, Jerry's on the board with one. So my question for you <laughs> is, would you describe my lead as a commanding lead or a dominating lead at this point? <laughs> oh, talking well, smack. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely dominating. <laughs> I'd, I'd classify it as a temporary lead. How about that? <laughs> oh, oh, I like that. Okay, well, let's put your money where your mouth is as we move into round three. Here is my right. question for you. It has to do with everyone's favorite saint, St. Nicholas. So here nice. are three statements. One of them is the lie. An analysis of his bones in 1953 revealed that he was six foot two, which was actually freakishly tall for the time. Statement number two, he was once, once jailed for punching another bishop in the face. Or three, he was said to be so devout that even as a baby, he refused to breastfeed on Wednesdays and Fridays because those were the fasting days in the church. Now, this one I actually know the answer to, <laughs> so I'm going to let Todd ruminate for a well, bit. Well, <laughs> I know he punched a guy. I'm not sure if he went to jail for it. The third one sounds fairly plausible. It seems like one of those tall tales that would be uh, passed around. Man, but being 6'2", that's, that's pretty big. I'll go with uh I'll go with his height being uh six two. Okay, that's what that's... it is. Yep. Okay, you guys think that is the lie. That is the lie. <laughs> okay, and you're both correct. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. He was actually freakishly short. Uh, so I think he, and there was an analysis of his bones done in 1953, and they they estimated that he would have been about like four foot eight or four foot nine. And even oh. though people were much shorter back then, even by those standards, that that's pretty short. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, he punched, uh, or at least you know, according to tradition, he punched Arius, yep. the arch heretic, in the face, and uh, and then the Virgin Mary and Christ visited him while he was in prison and handed him a, a stole and a book of gospels. Yep. Yep. So that was at the Council of Nicaea, where um, who was mm -hmm. the emperor? Um, Constantine. Yes, Constantine. So they were arguing over the the Trinity, right? I think um, Arius had a different view on like the the relationship between uh the trinity and then he was considered a heretic and yeah uh saint nicholas did not agree and they got into an argument and he <laughs> punched him and then constantine actually did put him in jail he had to spend the night in jail yep right. <laughs> oh man well, and now he delivers I, I, presents yeah <laughs> well i remember hearing about the punching punching him but i, I never i never didn't know if he went to jail for it for the night or not. So. So everyone the, remember, uh, this is a guy who knows if you've been naughty or nice. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Apparently, Arius there. was very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, Todd. Hurt us. All right. All right. This next one has to do with Christmas trees. Teddy Roosevelt banned the Christmas tree from the White House for environmental reasons. During the French and Indian War, French soldiers placed red apples in evergreen trees to remind them of home. Or the world's largest Christmas tree ever put on display was in 1950 in Seattle, Washington, and was 221 feet tall. Okay. Um, this is another one where I, I already know one of them is true, so it's down to the other two. And I'm trying to... I'm trying to think of how 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 high 220 feet is. Like by comparison, hmm. how tall is the Empire State Building? Oh, I should have looked that down. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> There's that book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, that that talks about anchoring bias. Where like if you uh -huh. if you ask one group of people how tall is the tallest tree. Uh, and they'll just give you like a really broad range of numbers. But then if you ask another group of people, do you think the tallest tree is taller or shorter than 100 feet? You know, and then like it doesn't matter what they answer. But then the next question you ask them is, how tall do you think the tallest tree is? Most of their answers are going to be really close to 
like 150 or whatever it is feet that you asked them in the previous question is called anchoring mm-hmm. bias. Like once you give someone a, a number, they're going to think that the actual answer is pretty close to that number. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if you had something in mind when you came up with the 220, because that seems really, really, really tall. Mm-hmm. That seems like abnormally tall. for. But I'm trying to think of something else that would be that tall to compare it to. <laughs> <laughs> the I mean I know I'm pretty sure the Teddy Roosevelt one is true yeah I think I remember true. reading that yeah um, the French and Indian uh, that sounds I mean that honestly that sounds very like a very French thing to do uh, well the Empire State Building depending on where you stop measuring it some people stop at the roof <laughs> some people stop at the tip is it is is anywhere from 1200 to 1400 feet okay hmm how tall is the Still. statue of liberty so i'm trying to think like cuz all right in my house the ceilings <clears throat> are like 12 feet high so i'm trying to think mm-hmm. like 20 20 of my houses on top of one of those would be yeah, I'm, I don't know. For some reason, I, I just I think it's that tall tree. I think transporting a tree that tall, like getting a tree that tall stood up and maintaining it. I could be totally wrong about that, but that's the answer. I'm locking in on that. Well, I mean, I don't even think the, the trees that the, the Vatican puts up every year. I mean, those ones are massive, and I, I don't think they're that tall either. So I'm going to have to agree and say it's the 220 feet. So both of you locked in on the tall Christmas tree? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that one is true. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 221, <laughs> 221 foot Douglas fir was placed in a shopping center in 1950 in Seattle, Washington. The Rockefeller Center tree that year was 77 feet. So the, the one that was false was the one about the French putting uh, apples in the evergreen trees. See, that one sounded true to me. I mean, I can actually see them doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, my goodness. I need to learn how to measure things better, I suppose. <laughs> 200. I mean, that's just, how did they even, oh, yeah. man. The they logistics of it are just, they're just, they're just boggling my mind. So the next time we play this game, it's something just occurred to me, is that if, uh-huh. if you're able to stump both of the other players, that should be worth something. Maybe like a half oh, yeah. point or something. But we didn't, we can't change the rules mid-game. But right. I, I was impressed yeah. that you fooled us both. Well, thank you. Wow. I appreciate that. Uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe I'm good at lying. I don't know. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Call Holly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So um, this is probably my weakest question out of all of them. So uh, it, it should be a gimme, but we'll see. Um, according to Christmas Connections, which is a subsidiary uh, UK based Christmas card company uh, of another company that's been around since 1906. They looked at data from all around the world, and they determined that the top-selling toy, and here's number A, in 1980 was the Rubik's Cube. Letter B, the top-selling toy of 1984 was Transformers, specifically Optimus Prime. Or the top-selling toy of 1985 was G.I. Joe. Which one of those do you think are incorrect? Oh, mm-hmm. see, this is the problem with uh, with like when the degrees are that small, like for between mm-hmm. 80 and because <laughs> Rubik's Cube could have been the top selling toy in one of those. But there's not enough distance between the years to make a good judgment because mm-hmm. it definitely was the top selling toy yeah. at one of the years in the 80. So maybe it makes sense to think, look, what are all the other toys from the 80s that would have been top sellers for the year? Transformers mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Teddy Ruxpin probably somewhere in there. Cabbage mm-hmm. Patch, Cabbage Patch dolls. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Game Boy was that eighties or nineties? Mm, that was that was right at the late eighties, early nineties. Okay, so that might be nine. Yeah, that was probably in a, you know regular uh, NES would have would have been one. Um, Not to get off topic, I, but there was a um, back in the seventies that game Simon. You know, like where you have to match the uh-huh. patterns. Oh colors. yeah, like, that thing was like enormous. And when the when the product actually came out, they had their launch party, like their media blitz thing at Studio 54 in New York. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Great place to have a <laughs> Simon Says. <laughs> I, still, I still love that game. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. That was pretty rad, I remember. Yeah. But it's definitely like, it's just based on your short-term memory. And just, you uh-huh. know, everyone knows that you can store, what is it, like seven to nine, like average person, five to seven things can stay in your short-term memory. And that's why mm-hmm. the game breaks down after like a minute. It's not like mm-hmm. you can build your skill at it, really, because all of the, um, or maybe do each of the colors have its own sound? Could you memorize like the sound patterns? I believe they do. I believe they I think they did. Oh, okay. uh-huh. I mean, it's been a while since I played it, but I think they did actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good game. Yeah, but not one I, of the ones. It didn't come out in the eighties. Right. Mm-mm. I'm. I'm. I believe. I believe the Rubik's Cube in 1980 would be the number one selling toy. Yeah, I could buy that. Was it 1980 though? Hmm. You you had to say that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, not like, my house of cards of confidence down because what was going on with gi joe was he a big thing in, in gi like joe mid 80s G- and 85 uh see that's the one that's got me i think by 85 it may have been slipping a little bit to where it was still a good seller but maybe not the top seller yeah that's where i'm leaning to to be honest mm, yeah so i'm i'm going gi joe in 85 i'm locking in on that too that is the lie. It was actually the Care Bears that was a top seller in 1985. G.I. Joe was never a top seller around the world. Although it did in um, in 84, it was uh, one of the top sellers in the U.S., but uh, not in 85. Mm-mm. So right. congratulations, you both get a point. We both scored a point, which yes. brings us to the end of round three. That was round three, yep, and a check of the scores. Brian is still in a lead at five points, no longer a commanding lead because Todd is right behind with four points. <laughs> Jerry, this this is your one of your last two chances to catch I know. up. <laughs> I think I'm pretty much locked in. My you are trailing place, <laughs> with two points. So let's see if you can redeem yourself with my question, starting off round four. And our category is weird retro foods for Christmas. Mm-hmm. So one of these is uh, two of these are are true, unfortunately, and only one of them is not. Statement number one, uh, in the 60s, Hellman's Mayonnaise published a recipe in a magazine for edible cranberry candles. You would actually light them on fire and then eat them. Uh, number two, Dr. Pepper once ran an ad suggesting that you serve its soda hot during the holidays as a holiday beverage. Number three, at some point, Jell-O published instructions for creating an entire gingerbread house suspended in a Jell-O mold. Hmm. One of those I'm about 92% sure is true. That is oddly specific. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. 90, 99 seemed like too high, but 90 <laughs> seemed too low. So. <laughs> so you didn't want to split the difference and say 95? You jumped well, to that, that, that seemed a little high as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Wow. Um, I want to say I did read something about Dr. Pepper being served hot. Mm. Yeah, that I know. That sounds that, like super familiar to me. That's that's the one I'm I'm fairly confident with. It seems like I read an ad, an old ad where they had it like in a pot with like uh, lemon slices or orange slices or something in it. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> but have you like? <laughs> I'm not trying to influence your decision making, but have you ever like left a bottle of Coke in the car on a summer day and then you yeah, come back gross. in and it's all hot and like you drink like hot carbonated beverages are the most disgusting <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, that's it's the worst. <laughs> um the the I want to say that um they did produce a recipe uh not Jello, the other one um, um was it Hellman's, Hellman's you said? Yeah, Hellman's. Yeah. Hellman's. yeah. I think they did. Yeah. I don't remember I, about edible yeah. candles, though. Uh, See, the one I'm leaning towards is the Jello because I just thought sh- sure how you could do the a house with Jello and have it, you know, but, still keep its form. Well, I mean, you just you you build the house and then you'd slowly fill it with Jello all around it, and then you put it in the fridge for the Jello to harden. Yeah, they but, did some. F- funky funky stuff with jello back in the days there was like <laughs> jello jello like a whole turkey dinner encased in a jello uh, mold with like stuffing and turkey but it was all jello <laughs> it was a different time <laughs> yeah yeah 
No. <laughs> oh man! Thank goodness for gastro pubs. Uh, yeah. mm. I'm. I'm gonna say it is the um, edible candles. Okay, I'm. I'm sticking it. with the Jello. Todd, I'm sticking with the Jello. You win the point. Man, I just cannot win today. <laughs> so, so Todd is now tied for first place with Brian. Um, yeah, Hellman's published something in the 1960s. And, you know, that was something that happened a lot in, in magazines back then. Still does, actually. You know, a brand will say, hey, use our mm. products to do this. And they created yeah. this thing called an edible dinner salad candle uh, made of mayonnaise, cranberry sauce, and uh, who knows what else. And there was whole <laughs> instructions for how you put the wick in and you serve it at the table, you light it, and then it was... Presumably, at some point, you blow that out and you eat it. Oh wow! But the the Jello question was plausible enough because, like I said, yeah. you know there were I've seen things for like a whole, like a tuna casserole Jello mold, like a ha- ham yeah. dinner. It's really, really gross stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've seen pictures from uh, my relatives, uh, some of their old photos where they have some of that stuff. That's why I thought it was possible. So, man, all right, tricky. <laughs> okay, Todd, let's see what you. All have. right. Um, we're going to the world of Hallmark keepsake ornaments. Mm. All righty. Hallmark caps the series run for keepsake ornaments at 12 years. In 1973, Hallmark introduced a small line of six glass ball ornaments and 12 yarn figures as the first collection of keepsake ornaments. Or in 2008, Hallmark released a teeny tiny Viewmaster ornament that actually works. Uh, that last one, I'm almost sure, is real. Mm-hmm. It's real, yeah. So now it's the other two. And I have to say, the only Hallmark keepsake ornament I have that I even know of is um, one of Fonzie. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, you know we get them every year. There's a uh, we we each each one of our family members we pick like two, and uh, and so we'll we'll save up and then when they you know are debuted in in July we go and we get the ones that are available and then we get the rest when they come out in October. But uh, yeah, so our tree has a ton of like homemade ornaments, um, you know, ornaments that are heirlooms and then a bunch of Hallmark ornaments. Right, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real it's, mishmash. It's sounds very like our tree, but. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm pretty sure the Viewmaster one is is also correct. Yeah. Um, what was the first one they kept the? They they cap a series, a, mm-hmm. a line of ornaments at twelve years. That, that I think it's that one. I, I mean, <laughs> so, well, what was the other one? The I, one I, about I, the ball of yarn. Like I, I believe they probably cap a series, but like twelve years. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure. The, the other one is in 1973. Hallmark introduced a small line of six glass ornaments and 12 yarn figures as the first collection of Hallmark keepsake ornaments. Yarn figures. Yarn figure. What is a yarn figure? Made Uh, out of yarn? Yeah, it'd be like a Santa Claus or Mrs. Claus just made out of yarn. Oh, that that sounds plausible, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I know those were pretty popular. Um, those that style. Uh, I mean, I remember, and of course, this is just anecdotal. But uh, I remember my grandma and uh, and and several of my aunts having ornaments in that style. I, I don't know if they were homemade, but I don't think they were Hallmark. I you know I, I keep going back to the first one, the capping at twelve years. I don't think it's I don't think it's twelve. I want to say it's a bit shorter, actually. Well, I'm just throwing darts blindfolded here, so I'll agree with you, Jerry, that that is the one that is the the lie. You locking it in? Locking it. Yeah, yep. that's it. You both picked the lie. Wow. All right. and, well, and, 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 Jerry did, fact, and I rode his coattails. <laughs> in, in fact, the uh, uh, line of Frosty Friends is now at 35 years in going still. So. <laughs> but I know there, and the funny thing is that there are actually some of their lines that only lasted like three or four years. So I mm-hmm. guess they just cap it based on, <laughs> based on popularity. 
Yeah. In fact, uh, this past year they actually released re-released some um, Star Wars uh, ornaments, and that's actually fairly rare for them to do. And mm. in fact, the years are always on the top of the boxes, and when you would go in the store, you would see uh, like a two thousand. I think it was two thousand. 18 or you know, it was just the year before when they had them so oh nice yeah well i know this year this past year they came out with a die cast iron man uh that was really neat but i i didn't get it because i was afraid it was just gonna you know bend the stuffings out of my tree <laughs> and it was just it was ridiculously heavy mm. <laughs> but it looked great it was great sculpt and yeah. uh, great painting so but all right, gentlemen. All right. Here's a tricky one for you. Oh, boy. <clears throat> the uh, the Roman Church has had many traditions for Christmas tide. So here's a few. There are three masses typically said on Christmas Day, with matins and lauds intervening traditionally. The Christmas octave, while established later than the Epiphany octave, is one of the few octaves remaining after the 1955 rubrical rubrical changes, or Christmas matins begins immediately with the first antiphon, disregarding the usual versicles and introductions. Which one of those three traditions do you think is the lie? Well, I think the second one is probably true. Hmm. 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 My guess will be a complete stab in the dark because yeah. I, I don't have much to base it on you have to get my mom on the phone she knows all about this stuff <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, I'm just gonna guess what was the third one again Jerry that the uh, Christmas matins begins immediately with the first antiphon and you disregard the usual versicles and introductions I don't even understand mm -hmm. what half of that means but I'm, I'm going with that one I'm that's locking the in I'll, that's the one that's I'm a, a I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm just I'm going to go with it just because it has the word disregard in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is the lie, but it's it's Epiphany matins that begins immediately with the first antiphon. Uh, oh. It tells you how ancient it is um because the versicles and introductions came later on. Uh, so um it, actually it's more ancient than the Christmas matins itself, which is kind of interesting. Oh wow. Hmm. All right, that brings round four to a close. Now, now Jerry, you're still in this. Um, there's no chance that you could catch up and overtake either of those, but, but I'm just no. letting you know you're still in the game. Uh, so the, <laughs> I appreciate that. The check on the score is that Brian has seven points, Todd has six, and Jerry has three. Well, I guess technically, if Todd doesn't score, there would be a tie for second place. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. All right, so Todd... You know I like you, but I also kind of hope you don't score any points this round. Right, right, right. <laughs> I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your category for the final question from me is uh, music. Statement number okay. one. The song Silver Bells was originally titled Tinkle Bells until the songwriter's wife pointed out that tinkle was common slang for urination. <laughs> Statement number two. <laughs> Paul McCartney makes an estimated $400,000 a year in royalties from his song Wonderful Christmas Time. And statement number three, Mariah Carey's song All I Want for Christmas is You was once banned from Minnesota's Mall of America because the lyric I don't want a lot for Christmas was deemed, quote, not compatible with commerce, end quote, by the mall's management. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> I did read last Christmas that Mariah Carey on All I Want for Christmas is You made like Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in royalties. So that leaves mm -hmm. me to think that All Paul McCartney's four fifty is probably about right because it doesn't get played as much. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to rule that one as true. Silver bells. I I do think that it was originally titled something else. I'm not yes. sure if it was Tinkle Bells, but it sounds. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that, I was thinking that was true. <clears throat> yeah, that, me too. Because I, I remember there was a name change, but I don't exactly remember what it was. In mm -hmm. the mall, the mall band. I mean, all I want for Christmas is you came out in 1994, so surely we wouldn't have had like bands on songs for reasons like that. 
I'm going with the uh, mall ban on. Yeah, all I agree. You. Locking them in. Yes. yes. All right, and you both spotted the lie. That was the one. <laughs> awesome. So nice. Yeah, uh, the Silver Bells was originally titled Tinkle Bells, and the songwriter. There are two songwriters. One of them was Jay Livingston. He's the one who came up with that title, and his wife was like, "Ah, uh, you know, I'm not so sure about that." Um, you know what else I, I just realized and I didn't realize this for a long long time until I started playing piano and I have a book of Christmas songs there is no such song as it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas the name of the song is it's beginning to look like Christmas it's just that the first oh. line ha- says a lot and that's what everyone thinks the name of the song is but it's not uh, huh. hmm. I, I don't think I ever paid that close attention to it it's never been one of my favorites uh so I, I just kind of overlooked that. That's wow. That's really cool. Mm. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Now that you said that, I do remember because me and Dwayne did that uh, Christmas countdown showdown, and that song was both in there, and it was like uh, there was this beginning to look, uh, and then uh, in parentheses it finished out a lot like Christmas. Yeah. So. Wow. Hmm. I never put it put it together. All right, Todd. Uh, <clears throat> All righty, this last. This last subject is <coughs> about me. So, <laughs> oh, oh no. yeah, yeah. Remember, yeah. Personal question. <laughs> yeah, personal. <laughs> so I have uh, uh, three statements about myself for Christmas time and see if you can spot the lie. I once was in a musical rendition of A Christmas Carol where I played Tom Jenkins, had a speaking part, had to sing and dance, and did a, com- a comedic pratfall. Um, one Christmas, I put so many lights on our Christmas tree that we could not have the Christmas tree on and run the microwave at the same time. <laughs> or, or one of my favorite Christmas gifts was Santa left me the complete set of Voltron Lions. Okay, here's how I'm going to piece this one together. You said a comedic pratfall, which... Mm-hmm. You would not use that terminology unless you had some theater knowledge. Uh, like someone who doesn't would just say, oh, and I had to fall down. So mm-hmm. because of the, the, the insider knowledge and specificity of that phrasing, I'm going to assume that one's true. The Christmas lights and the microwave. So both of those, well, microwaves can, are what, like 1,200 watts? Christmas lights mm-hmm. are very low energy, right? Like Unless you're talking about like the big, the uh, incandescent ones, the you know the ones mm-hmm. that you, like, you screw yeah. in individually, even those are pretty low energy. That one, yeah, but you do have to be careful because if you put in, I mean, in the incandescents usually you can limit to about three before you start to pop a breaker. Um, mm. you, LEDs, you're right; you can run you know a million of them in a row. But would he be putting LEDs on his Christmas tree like this? In this day and age, I, I, I don't, I mean, LEDs are common. I don't think he'd be yeah. putting incandescents. So, but this was uh, at some point in an indeterminate past. So it could be, could be. Yeah. Least. So the other one, like is the, the, the third one about what he got for Christmas. I feel like there's nothing to go on there. Right. With the other two, you're like, okay, <laughs> like there's some little clues, you know, like this, the phrasing or the logic, but that one is just like, I don't know. That's, that's a coin toss. Well, see, and I did get the all the Voltron Lions one Christmas, so I, I to me that seems again that seems very plausible. I, I think it's the uh, the microwave and the lights one. Honestly, I'm kind of thinking that one too. Yeah, yeah, I'm locking in with that. Yeah. Well, you're both are wrong. <laughs> really. <laughs> the year the year I wanted Voltron Lions, I ended up getting Voltron vehicles, and I was. Very, uh, uh, that's a bummer. Unhappy. Well, <laughs> yeah. disappointed. I wouldn't say unhappy. But no, uh, one year I put 2,400 uh, incandescent lights on my Christmas tree. Incandescent. And we couldn't, there you go. And yeah. uh, we couldn't run the microwave or the tree at the same time. In fact, we had to open the front door to let the heat out when we had the tree on. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah. And, LED's uh, the way to go, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I sell them for a living. <laughs> <laughs> they're just, they're more, they're safer. <laughs> So yeah, well, and I and I was uh, I did have a small part in the Christmas Carol musical, so Yeah, I, I knew that right away, right? When you said comedic <laughs> Pratfall, I'm like, all right, this, Pratfall, guy, yeah. this guy knows theater. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I will bring us home with uh 
some 80s cartoons. Okay, so while celebrating Christmas, He-Man and She-Ra save two Earth children from Hordak while Skeletor has a crisis of conscience. The Silverhawks rescue Santa from Monstar and his henchmen after receiving a message from Tally Hawk. Or during a Christmas toy drive, Cobra uses a shrink ray to sneak inside G.I. Joe headquarters, steal the Joe's vehicles, and frame them. Hmm. Okay, the He-Man one, I think that is that is the plot, right? Like these two kids, I remember, I remember that one scene where they're like, they're really cold because they're outside and, you know, they're like, oh, I'm so mm. cold. Um, so that one, I would bet any amount of money is, is real. Mm-hmm. The other two, again, I'd just be throwing darts here. The G.I. Joe one sounds more plausible than the other one, just on its own mm. merits. Uh, see, I, was, I would think that the G.I. Joe one was a lie. It just seems like a... I don't know, for some reason, the, sh- the shrink ray in G.I. Joe doesn't seem like it fits very well. But Silverhawk one seems, that seems to line up with what I know about them. I'm going G.I. Joe. I'm going to lock in on G.I. Joe being false. All right. So what should I lock in on? Because the thing is, if I if you're right and I go the opposite one, then you win. But if you're mm-hmm. right and I agree with you, then we're tied for first place. Uh-huh. So my strategy uh-huh. at this point is just not to lose. And then if mm-hmm. we're both wrong, then we're both still tied. So right. that is the best of all options is for me to agree so with you. I should have I let you choose first. Yeah, you should have. And, uh, <laughs> and, and in uh, common G.I. Joe parlance, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. And what's the other half of the battle? <laughs> Do you remember those? Was that G.I. Joe? Red, or was that red just lasers like... and blue lasers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, so I'm yeah. locking in on G.I. Joe as well. Okay, so you're both set? Okay, yeah, the G.I. Joe is actually true. Oh. They, uh, Cobra did use a shrink ray to sneak inside Joe headquarters <laughs> during a toy drive. The Silverhawks one was was the lie. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh. Yay, well, I uh, stumped someone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and the next time we play this, remember, that'll be worth something, but that was not yeah. part of our original rule. So here's the right. final rundown. It, not bad. A lot of, oh. lot of points on the board. Um, Brian and Todd finished off with seven points each, and Jerry had a respectable four points. All right. Well, thank you very awesome. much, gentlemen, for telling some truths and telling some lies and spreading some Christmas cheer here on Christmas Past. You know, oh, this was you. a... It's quite a blast. Thanks for having us. Yes, and I hope to do so it much. again soon. Thanks, guys. Yes. Uh-huh. No problem. Merry Christmas. So, how did you do? I'll bet it was better than you thought you'd do. But either way, I'm glad you spent some time with us today in another edition of Christmas in Quarantine. And there will be another one tomorrow. Until then, let me remind you, as always, that Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California, by yours truly, Brian Earle. You can drop a line anytime at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you haven't yet joined the private Christmas Past Facebook group, well, maybe today's the day you will. If you're enjoying these episodes, I wonder if you have friends and family in your life who could also use a little Christmas spirit these days. So why not help more people discover this show? It's as simple as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Both of those are quick and painless ways to show support. They take less than a minute, but they really do make a big difference. And if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, I'll even send you an official Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card is my way of saying thanks. Reach out to me for details on that. Until tomorrow, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.